At its peak, Money with Katie had 12 different revenue streams across different sponsors, affiliates, and products, and each month would see a spike and a dip in those different areas. So I was never relying on any one thing to carry the team. And I think that long-term mindset around diversity of income and creating a multi-legged stool as opposed to, say, just selling one product or working with one sponsor was part of the reason why the high income months came relatively easily and quickly. Welcome back, rich girls and boys, to The Money with Katie Show, the show that looks at personal finance with a bit of a wider lens and dives deep into the money topics that matter. This show is more about the broader financial decisions that have a major impact on your life and less the show with hacks for saving money on your car insurance. But before we dive too deep, be sure to give this video a thumbs up and to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can be notified every time we post a new video. Anyway, back to business. Today, we are talking about how to monetize content creation. Very meta, I know. Based on my experience generating around $250,000 in revenue in my first year of monetization. The inspiration for this episode came from a blog post that I wrote a while ago about how March 2020's mindset shift, aka I need to get my shit together and protect myself from the uncertainty of what's to come, can continue to serve us in 2022. And in that post, I offhandedly made a comment about how some months Money with Katie would make forty to $50,000 and that it was pretty consistently netting over 20,000 a month in 2021. Rather predictably, a lot of people were like, yeah, yeah, recession proofing, that's cool. But um, how the hell did you make $40,000 a month from a blog? Except for the one comment that was like, uh, I honestly would have expected it to be more. So, okay, pal, sorry to disappoint, but I've never really gone into any level of depth about this because I guess I just figured people didn't really care. Like you're probably following a personal finance creator to learn about personal finance, not about how to monetize a blog about personal finance, but alas, the people asked and I'm going to deliver. So I apologize to those of you who have already heard this story 48 times, but I started Money with Katie in April, 2020 during the pandemic. And I decided in July of 2020, so just a few months later, that after I got turned down for a writing job that I desperately wanted at Nerd Wallet that I would double down on Money with Katie and I would try to make something of it. Have you ever seen Curb Your Enthusiasm? Do you remember Latte Larry's, his spite store because of Mocha Joe's? You know what I'm gonna call it? What? Latte Larry's. Money with Katie was kind of a spite blog in that way. I remember I texted a friend saying that my goal in life was to rank above Nerd Wallet on Google and make more than that gig's salary from doing it on my own. So today, I want to break down how it went from a tiny little website with a few blog posts and zero dollars in revenue to the point that I referenced in the blog post, which I will link in the show notes, where it was doing 25000 a month pretty consistently. So first things first, this episode is going to be pretty specific to monetizing content as a content creator for the bulk of it, so my journey. But the second half, the last chunk, is an interview with Lauren, and that will pertain to management of the variable income that is so common for entrepreneurs. So I think the easiest way to do this is to go in chronological order of how and when I monetized. So that's the structure we're going to run with. Um, writing this episode was a little bit overwhelming because it felt like there was just way too much to say. So I apologize in advance that it's probably going to be an hour long. But depending on the response to this one, maybe we'll do a follow up. I don't know. But I do want to cover the major pieces today. How money with Katie makes money. How I set up those sources of income and the pros and cons of each. Um, I'll try to be as specific as possible and give you everything from the scripts that I used to reach out to sponsors to actual names of companies and products I liked and didn't like, you know, to real numbers. I'll also share the one thing that changed the trajectory of Money with Katie the most and why it was the best investment I made throughout my entire solopreneur journey. So let's start with an overview, the different ways that Money with Katie made money. For the most part, we're going to be talking about 2021. That was really the only year that I was completely on my own and doing this really with no real information besides what I was learning as I went. To start at the truest starting point, 
I created money with Katie on the website Squarespace and I used a lot of Squarespace products early on. I still think they are the best website provider out there. I've used them, WordPress, Weebly, Wix, but I no longer use their native email platform or their course slash member area platform. At first, I really liked having everything in one place, but you'll see why we moved away from that in a little bit. Anyway, there were a few key ways that Money with Katie made money in 2021. The first is digital products like the Wealth Planner and digital asynchronous courses like Budget Like a Millionaire and High Earners Code. So the Wealth Planner sold for $30 in 2021, Budget Like a Millionaire was $197 and High Earners Code was $397. I also used affiliate links like the ones that I use for credit cards and certain partner products. So I'll get into this in the episode, but my TLDR on affiliate links is that they're usually not super worthwhile unless the commission is high or you anticipate a super high volume of transactions. And then the third would be sponsorship income from brands brands that pay to sponsor blog posts or Instagram posts. That's probably the most straightforward and desirable way to monetize a blog, in my opinion, because it doesn't cost your readers anything and brands can build awareness with your community for a cost that's pretty small to them relative to their traditional media advertising budgets. There are two major themes that I want to emphasize that I would point to in my own experience when and when I honor these themes, I tend to make good choices. And when I go against them, I tend to not like the results. The first overarching theme that I'd highlight for sources of revenue is being very aware of how much work each source requires for the ROI that you get. For example, one of the reasons that I stopped doing one-on-ones was because it was very time consuming and very specific. It was a one-to-one -one conversation by definition, which meant the rate that I would make in that hour was limited to what an individual would pay. And the work delivered only benefited that one individual. So it's not scalable beyond devoting more hours to doing it. And at that rate, your ROI is capped. Compare that to something like a sponsored newsletter or blog post. A solid blog post takes me around an hour or two to write, not counting research or preparation, and I could make anywhere between $750 to $2,000 for a blog post at the time. So that's A, a much higher ROI on that hour or two of time, and B, a higher value ROI because thousands of people can read and benefit from the blog post as opposed to the one person who benefited from a one-on-one. -on -one. It's also worth noting that delivering a bunch of free content to the masses is likely to lead to actual sales down the road, though I hadn't really thought that part through yet at the time. It really didn't have anything to do with why I made the decision at the time, but it ended up being true later. The other reason that I like sponsored content comes back to what I mentioned above. I really like giving away the product for free and using the ad model to be compensated for my work. So both sides of the equation, impact and return on time investment, seemed to be the overarching questions that I would come back to time and time again when I was making these types of trade-offs and decisions. The second overarching theme that I would highlight is long-term versus short-term thinking when it comes to who you align yourself with. So while it's very tempting in the early days to jump on the first thing that comes your way, I would caution against partnerships that don't represent products you actually use and love. If the first time that you're hearing about something is when they're reaching out to you to try to pay you to talk about it, it's probably not a very good fit. Same goes for products that you're developing for other people. I am certainly a proponent of developing the minimum viable product, so something that's viable enough to ship to an audience, but nowhere near baked or perfect, and then getting user feedback and doing testing with it. But I'd likely discourage you from selling and marketing something that hasn't already been vetted and tested pretty aggressively, because once someone buys something from you one time, that experience is likely going to inform purchase intent in the future. So if you're going to market with something too quickly, it can be damaging in the long term, even if it does provide some short term gains. And on a similar, slightly related note, I would lump in diversity of revenue in this short term versus long term bucket too. At its peak, Money with Katie had 12 different revenue streams across different sponsors, affiliates, and products. And 
each month would see a spike and a dip in those different areas. So I was never relying on any one thing to carry the team. And I think that long-term mindset around diversity of income and creating a multi-legged stool as opposed to say just selling one product or working with one sponsor was part of the reason why the high income months came relatively easily and quickly. We've talked broadly about different sources of income and the two major themes. Now let's dig into each source of income specifically. I want to start with the flagship product, the wealth planner. So we'll talk about these digital products first. There are certainly business coaches who have this value ladder thing down, which is really just a fancy way of saying you have different products at increasing price points that build on one another. So ideally someone buys your lowest price product is super satisfied and then ends up up leveling into a higher priced item later. The thought process here is that a buyer is a buyer is a buyer. Someone who purchases from you once is more likely to purchase from you again, assuming you didn't totally fleece them and sell them shit on a shingle. It's generally accepted in the world of e-commerce that it is cheaper to retain your existing customers than to go out and keep acquiring new ones. So I didn't intentionally create this for myself. I didn't even really know what it was. I wasn't aware of the concept when I started, but I did create the wealth planner in 2020 and then revamped it for 2021, not realizing that my 25 to $30 product was kind of the perfect entry to such a value ladder. I tried to promote and market it around the new year, knowing that people would be more open to a budgeting and financial planning product around resolution times. And that did seem to work. So I really just promoted it on Instagram and I had a few thousand followers at the time, I think probably around 4,000. And I'd been posting blog posts twice a week for mm, eight months at that point. Nothing was sponsored yet. I had been doing money with Katie for free for those eight months by the time I launched the product. And I think the first round of Wealth Planner launches netted about $5,000, which is pretty good for a $30 product in an audience of less than 5,000 people. So quick math, that's like 133 sales, but usually lower priced items do have that volume advantage. So that was the first time I sold anything to anyone. And it was scary. I would um, try to work it into my content too, which was relatively easy because I used my own product and I would take screenshots of my planner for monthly spending and saving reviews. I didn't really have a methodical way of promoting it though until about halfway through 2021 which is when I started using an actual content calendar. And by actual content calendar, I mean a Google calendar where I would add tasks each day for what I wanted to post. It was not high tech at all. And once I figured out how many times I needed to promote the planner each month and the times of the month where it was most effective to consistently generate a few thousand dollars in sales, I would try to enact those best practices going forward. So I would link it in a blog post once, once a month. I would share screenshots as my own spending review. I would generally mention it whenever I was updating my own. It was nothing crazy and I didn't have any email marketing yet. So it was all reliant on Instagram, which is a little risky and we'll talk about why later. But to date, the Wealth Planner is responsible for roughly $144,000 in total revenue in about 18 months or 8,000 a month on average, once I had that well-oiled machine going. Notice how I said I didn't have any email marketing. We're gonna put a pin in that, we're gonna come back to it because it's very important. So shifting gears, let's talk getting sponsors for content. Quickly before we get into this, a clarification. Sponsors are people who pay you to put their brand name on your content while affiliate marketing is where you are paid a commission for a sale that you make for a brand. Now, around the time that I'm talking about February, 2021, I decided I wanted to try to get my first sponsor. I had those 4,000 followers. I felt pretty good about that. So I reached out to a few brands that I was using and loving, and I literally sent them a DM and I'm gonna read it to you. I had to go back in my DMs to find this. It's kind of embarrassing. I said, 
Hey there, I blog about money and I recommend your product constantly through my posts. Do you have an affiliate program? I would love to make our relationship official. I have a slew of organic recommendations tied to my personal account with you, but I was curious if there's any formal affiliate program. I then linked an example of a blog post that I had written about their product. And a few weeks later, they got back to me and we set up a call. Notice that I asked them about an affiliate program because I was not about to be swinging for the fences right away, but on the call, they basically said it was up to me, whether I wanted a flat rate for a post or if I wanted to go the affiliate model route. And at the time I wasn't really sure. So I asked them what their flat rate would be. And they offered me $2,000 for two blog posts. So after I picked up my jaw off the floor, I readily agreed to that and we signed a contract. So that first sponsorship was huge for me because it established what I then felt moving forward was my market rate. I thought, okay, great. If someone's willing to pay me two grand to write two posts, that's clearly what my stuff is worth. So moving forward, when I would DM other brands, that was the rate that I had in mind. And usually I'd send a DM like the one I read you and most of the time I would not get a reply, but if I was persistent, I would usually get them to send me an email address at the very least. And then once I got someone on email, I would ask to set up a call. And then on the call, I would walk them through some of my work and I would ask them if they were interested in sponsoring something. And at that point, we would usually start to talk about money and I would ask their budget and I would share my rate. So I would typically ask for budget first and then depending on how cagey they were, I would share the rate of two blog posts for 2000. Sometimes they wouldn't even blink and they would just agree to the price. And then I would know that I underpriced myself. And other times they would tell me that they had no budget whatsoever and they would need to use an affiliate model. I didn't really agree to the affiliate model for much, but for the products that were free or super low cost that I also felt really strongly about, I was okay with it because I knew that I would be talking about them anyway. Part of the reason that I started using the content calendar though, despite being the only person working on this stuff, was because each sponsor would buy a package that guaranteed a certain number of sponsored posts in a defined time frame. So maybe I would write a blog post about budgeting and then a budgeting app was the sponsor. I had to remember and plan for those posts so that I could deliver everything on time. So I would usually plan one month at a time and basically denote on the calendar when something was sponsored by a brand and then make sure the week before that I had any necessary approvals buttoned up with compliance or whoever I needed to run things by. And it wasn't until the end of 2021 that I actually built a real media pitch document that included a little intro about me and how many followers I had and the blog traffic I was getting and then details about that traffic from Google Analytics with an official price sheet where I had a breakdown of my offerings. So before I sold to Morning Brew with my audience of 25,000, I was charging $4,500 per month to a presenting sponsor who would get two blog posts and two Instagram posts and then $2,000 for an in-depth product review and then $500 for a podcast episode sponsorship, which is so funny in retrospect for level setting. Those were my prices when I had 25,000 followers and a few hundred downloads per episode. Today, I'm no longer really involved in the sales process because I sold to Morning Brew. So their sales team now prices and packages all of that. But at the time, I still kept my sponsor roster pretty lean, mostly because I was really only working with people that I was reaching out to myself. And since I was charging enough, I didn't really feel like I needed to expand or have 12 sponsors to, you know, make everything run. I basically had three main sponsors that were all on that $4,500 a month plan. So it was recurring revenue of 13,500 a month from those three brands in various contract lengths. And if you're thinking about doing this, I would recommend making a PDF pitch document that has that breakdown of these numbers, AKA who follows you or reads or listens or watches your content, how much you are charging for things and, and maybe results of other campaigns that you've done because it just makes it easier on you to pitch new sponsors and to justify your value. So I pitched Tax Act for 2022 um, before I joined Morning Brew and they were initially interested, but we couldn't come to an agreement. I still plugged them in my tax post because that's who I truly supported. And I'm not going to hold it against them that we couldn't come to an agreement, but 
last year before I was using Tax Act. I liked Credit Karma, so I was pitching Credit Karma to no avail, as well as a few other big name firms that I liked for various reasons. And a lot of the time it would just fall through or they wouldn't get back to me or they would hear my prices and then they would ghost me. And I think getting used to being ghosted is part of the game. Persistence matters. Not everybody is going to reply. In fact, most people will not. But the ones that do are the ones that you want to be ready and have that PDF on lock so that you can send it off to them and, and hopefully close the deal. So now that we've covered sponsors, let's talk about affiliates more deeply. So affiliate marketing. This is a relatively easy one to get started with. And there were two sponsors that I also had an affiliate relationship with. They would pay to sponsor a specific piece of content, but then I would have a unique link that would track signups. Um, but really the major piece of the affiliate puzzle for me was credit cards. I was already writing about travel rewards and credit card hacking from day one. That was actually the nature of the job that I was going for at NerdWallet. So after about six months of doing that, I got an email from a guy that runs a credit card affiliate program. And so basically if someone signs up for a credit card through my link, and obviously all of this has to be disclosed properly and there are lots of compliance rules around credit card affiliate programs, but if they signed up through my link, I would make a commission. So I would usually post once or twice a month about travel rewards. And I had a pretty extensive back catalog of breakdowns of which cards I have and why, and then those had affiliate links in them. So my commission from this source of revenue started in March, 2021, and it ranged anywhere from 1,500 to $7,000 a month. It was pretty variable depending on whether or not the cards that I like and recommend had good signup bonuses. Sometimes they would all have terrible signup bonuses and that would be a really slow month, but Again, that's why you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. So when it comes to affiliates, I find that they are not very effective if you just have an Instagram presence. And I'm sure some people will disagree with that, but I found that the blog, AKA a platform where your content is discoverable via search engines and lives in perpetuity is a really good way to create additional revenue from affiliate links. So for example, I did a product breakdown unsponsored last year that for whatever reason started ranking really well in Google when you searched for that product. And I haven't checked in a while, but for a hot minute there for a few months, it was the first or second thing on the search results page. So I had an affiliate link at the bottom of the article that generated $9 in commissions every time someone signed up for a free trial. And that was creating anywhere between $1,500 and $2,000 per month in revenue that was almost entirely passive because the blog post had been written and published months ago and was just fortunately ranking and pulling in new people. So I do want to pause here and note that I did not and do not have Google AdSense on my site. I don't like banner ads or the fact that I can't control what shows up since it's based on your search history, not my preferences. So since I wasn't getting millions of hits a month, which is pretty much the level of traffic you need to make real money from AdSense, I just opted not to use it. But this affiliate link at the bottom of an article that's ranking is a pretty similar in the sense that I didn't have to do any other marketing for that article or email it to anyone. I never talked about it really beyond that initial week that I posted it. The Google algorithm just smiled upon me and created some passive revenue. The last thing that I want to cover today with some specificity is courses. I initially used Squarespace's member areas platform for my first course, Budget Like a Millionaire. And I wanted to create Budget Like a Millionaire because I had done so many one-on-ones with people in the past who needed help budgeting. And I realized most people needed the same type of help or had the same types of problems. So I figured I'll just codify everything that I've learned into a course that someone can just take on their own. So it was four modules with three lessons in each module. And then there was a mix of video and written content and then some supplemental workbook material. And when I launched it in May, 2021, I felt like I had totally flubbed the launch. I literally posted a ranty IGTV talking about it. It was like nine minutes long. And I told people, hey, I just launched this today. Go look at it on my website. 
And it wasn't exactly an example of marketing prestige, but it did sell like $3,000 worth in the first month and then would generate another three to 5,000 a month thereafter. But keep in mind, this is a $200 product. I was only selling a handful at a time and I did not feel like I had a really good method in place. I tried to market it monthly by posting about it every single month, but there was no timeliness or urgency since it was always on and self-paced. This is a key point for selling something like a course. When you have no natural urgency or reason to promote something, you have to invent reasons. And those are hard to come by and over time they can exhaust your audience. So I learned after the fact that it's much more efficient to time box when you run courses, have opening and closing dates, or create artificial urgency with pricing cuts for existing customers that expire after a set period of time. And I really learned from this mistake when I launched Tire Earners Code later that year in November. So I wanna break down how I launched that one and why it was so different. Which brings me to maybe the best thing I ever did for Money with Katie, the power of email marketing. First of all, the one major investment I made was in my email marketing guru. I spent a few thousand dollars getting my email marketing guru in place and paying for her services. But in order to find her, I basically posted a call to action with a form asking my community on Instagram if anyone had email marketing experience and would wanna get paid to set up funnels for me. So more on that in a second. And I got a great response from a gal that I ended up hiring hourly. She is amazing. Shout out Anna. She set up this super intense flowchart from day one that she showed me the very first time we ever met that showed how we would add people to an email list through a free offering. Then we would share free, valuable content with them and ask them to tell us what they were interested in and then send them into a different flow based on what they told us. Now, this is email marketing 101 best practices, but I had no idea how to execute it. And my tech stack was woefully unprepared for the level of sophistication that she wanted to bring to it. So we ended up switching in November, 2021 from all Squarespace hosted products to Flowdesk for email, Zapier for communicating between the sales platform and the email provider, and then Thrivecart for the courses and the digital products. So when we launched Hire Earners Code, she basically set up a wait list and this sales sequence that would kick off for people who were hand raisers, AKA they're telling us they're interested in the product. They're joining a wait list that we are telling them to join if they wanna learn more. And then we marketed to them once a week for about a month before the launch. Then at the launch, we had this introductory price for the first weekend, and then the price went up by $100. So we launched at $297 and then eventually increased to $397. That initial launch weekend, we did about $50,000 in sales. So it was pretty outrageous. We only had about 800 people on the wait list for the product, but the conversion rate was high. So I think that's a testament to having a wait list for a product that you're about to launch and then progressively sharing more about that product to those people via email before it launches and then launching to them specifically with an intro price that's lower than what is being publicly marketed. So compare a $3,000 launch with no email marketing whatsoever to a properly launched product that does $50,000 in sales in three days. That is why my big flashing neon sign to anyone that's trying to monetize via selling products is that a good email marketer is worth their weight in gold. I have learned that People don't really buy or convert, as the sales gurus say, on social media. They are on social to consume free content. They're likely not going to make a major purchase decision when they're scrolling Instagram. But email is a channel where you have a one-to-one -one relationship with that person. They have invited you into their inbox and they are far more likely to make a purchase if they're reading your emails and agreed to receive them. The other bonus from building an email list is that you quote unquote own that list. You don't own your audience on Instagram or on TikTok or on Twitter. Those platforms own that audience. 
email, like a blog, is decentralized in the sense that people can come to you if they want to, and you can contact them when you want to without relying on an algorithm to smile upon you. So my TLDR is start building an email list from day one. And I'm not an email expert, but I think the general best practices are don't be too pushy or overly communicative. But if you are frequently providing real free value to people, they will be able to make a purchase decision that they're confident in. And even if they don't want to buy anything from you, they can still benefit from that free content that you're putting out there and be a valuable part of the larger community that you're growing. So in wrapping up, like I said, I feel like we could go 10,000 feet deeper into every single one of these, but Whether you are starting your own content creation business or you were just curious how the hell I made money doing this, I hope this satisfied your curiosity. I learned all of this as I went. I made plenty of mistakes and I didn't grow anywhere nearly as quickly as a lot of the other accounts that I see on Instagram. But I do think that the monetization path that I took ended up being very lucrative. And had I not sold to Morning Brew, I think it could have been a pretty nice little lifestyle business. And I do have my own qualms, I think, that I want to mention about monetizing people's attention. So I don't necessarily love the ad model for that reason. But I do think that at the end of the day, the positives outweigh the negatives when it comes to creating valuable content that people can access for free and then having a brand pay for it instead of having the content consumers pay for it. Now let's shift gears and welcome our guest, Lauren. So Lauren, you are the director of financial advice at Stash. Can you help me understand what that job entails? Like I want to set the stage and give people a sense of your background um, because as someone who spends a lot of time qualifying that everything I'm saying is not financial advice, I really would love to know what someone whose literal title is financial advice does. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, First, I will join you and preface my answer by saying that nothing that I'm sharing today should be considered financial advice. Um, What I'm hoping to cover should be considered education. Perfect. However, um, I do provide financial advice as a profession. I've been working in financial services for about 15 years. I do hold multiple licenses that allow me to give advice And most importantly, I'm a certified financial planner, which means um, listeners should know that I'm a fiduciary and I'm always obligated to put my client's interests ahead of my own. Um, So basically, I'm, I'm required to only give objective advice. And that's part of the reason why Stash was such an attractive place for me. Uh, For those who aren't familiar, Stash is an industry leading subscription platform empowering everyday Americans to build wealth. Um, We enable long-term financial wellness of more than 6 million Americans who want to invest in themselves. So as the director of financial advice, I help the company identify ways of providing financial advice to our customers through in-app tools and and content. Hmm. Okay, very cool. Side note on the CFP exam, I've been trying to make my way through those prep books over the last few months and... It is drier than I thought it was going to be. I was like, I love financial planning and I am struggling to get through these. So anyway, this episode is all about making it as a creative entrepreneur. And one of the chief complaints that I hear from entrepreneurs and other people that have variable income is that variable income makes budgeting and investing really challenging. I think often because so much of the typical financial advice we hear in the space is all about the power of automation and automating your savings. And I think that 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 is typically harder when you don't have a set standard biweekly paycheck that you're counting on. So what types of mistakes do you often see people making with variable income? Uh, I would probably say it falls into one of three categories. So there are some some pretty common ones. The first is not having enough cash. Uh, The second would be failing to separate your personal finances from the business finances. Mm. And then um, the third would be either failing to save or invest for retirement or in a tax efficient manner of some kind. Um, I would, you know, first say regardless of where you are in your self-employment journey, If you haven't separated your personal finances and your business finances, you'll want to try to do that as soon as possible. And, um, you know, we'll talk about this probably in a little bit more detail, 
But you'll also want to be mindful about keeping capital available. So this is true whether you're self-employed, but also if you have variable income like commission or large quarterly or annual bonuses, the nature of variable income makes cash more important to smooth out those choppier inflows. Um, and as far as you know, the, the struggle to, to save and invest is concerned, especially when it comes to retirement, uh, making that transition from having a regular paycheck where maybe a percentage was going into a 401k every paycheck, it is harder to figure out how to put money aside consistently for the long term, but it's just as important, if not more so. Uh, I would say try setting a target percentage and invest and save um, at that percentage regardless of what your inflows look like. And again, that's just another reason why cash is so helpful so that you can still pay yourself consistently and therefore try to save and invest consistently, like consistently even um, when the income for the business is a little less predictable. Hmm. Yeah, it took me more time than I would like to admit to set up a business checking account for the longest <laughs> time. I was very much in the camp of, well, it's all just going to me. I'm the only employee of my own little business. So who cares if it goes directly into my personal checking? And then someone was like, you know, the IRS can audit you, right? And that would make that <laughs> very complicated. So I think uh, I, I was scared into doing what you're describing, but that makes sense. Aside from, just to dive a little bit deeper there, aside from having a business checking account separate from your personal checking and, and keeping that separation of church and state. Are there any other things that someone should be aware of when we're talking about properly dividing the two and keeping them separate? Yeah. So I think it, the, the checking account, the sort of operational nature of the inflows and outflows of the expenses or income of the business is important, but the same would be true for if you use a business credit card versus a personal mm. credit card. Um, and when, you know, we can talk a little bit more about investing, but there would be scenarios where you may have investable assets that belong to the business. Uh, so I would say the best you can to really separate everything, mm -hmm. um, the more helpful it'll be for you, but also the other professionals who may inevitably help you when you get to the point where you have an attorney or you have an accountant and God forbid you do get audited <laughs> and someone is trying to help you go through that Fingers process. Crossed. <laughs> exactly. Let's hope that day never comes, but you want to be prepared. If you can keep everything separate, it will be most helpful. Okay. Amazing. So what do you tell clients who are in that transition period from a salaried role to a variable income? What is What would be the first tangible step that we should take to set ourselves up for success and, and financial safety in a new endeavor? Yeah. So this may be a slightly unpopular opinion, but the very first thing I love it. I, <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Um, the very first thing I want someone to be thinking about if you're diving into self-employment is how you plan to pay yourself. I know it's challenging enough to transition from a consistent paycheck to variable income, but doing that as an entrepreneur who hasn't thought about how to take a salary can make it even harder. Um, many entrepreneurs try to go as long as possible without paying themselves in order to keep more cash in the business. And that's not bad advice, but it is recommended that you try to figure out how to pay yourself pretty quickly. Managing your business budget is a lot like managing your personal budget. And on a personal level, the saying pay yourself first is great advice because it encourages you to save and you limit your spending to what's left over after that. The same can be true for your business. Uh, of course, you have to pay your bills and your vendors, but you want this business to be sustainable and you're going to have to pay yourself if that's the case. So rather than take a small paycheck with what might be left over at the end of the month, treat your salary like a payroll expense and let the business be responsible for paying you um, at the onset of every month. So it doesn't mean you're paying yourself what you were making prior to self-employment. It can be mm -hmm. a very modest amount, but I would suggest you know, talking to other entrepreneurs that are in the same space or talk to an accountant who works with those folks and get a sense of 
what would be reasonable for you to pay yourself. It may be a small percentage of the income of the company, but getting in that habit will really set you up for more success so that you're managing the business spending better and it'll really help with the sustainability of the business itself as well as your ability to commit to it. Mm, okay, that's super helpful. So I guess in that same vein and, and kind of harkening back to something you said about cash earlier, um, my thoughts on emergency funds in general is that we often tell people to have six months of expenses and cash sitting on the sidelines, but it seems to me that that calculus is a little bit different for people with variable income. So I would love if you would kind of expound there and talk me through how you think about the cash equation for someone that has variable income. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I absolutely believe the liquidity needs of an entrepreneur differ greatly from someone who has W-2 income. Yeah. The emergency run emergency fund rule of thumb uh, for most people is to keep somewhere between three to six months worth of essential expenses. But I strongly encourage anyone who is self-employed to keep closer to one year's worth of expenses mm. in cash. Um, so for many people, it is in fact double. Um, the ebbs and flows of your variable income doesn't only make budgeting a challenge, but it does warrant keeping more cash on hand to get you through times when you may have reduced cash flow. One of the biggest factors in determining how many months worth of your expenses you should keep in cash is how long it, you would expect it would take you to replace lost income. Mm -hmm. So for someone with traditional employment who has highly marketable skills, they may very reasonably be able to find a new job in three to six months if something happens. But if you're working for yourself and you're trying to grow a business, you want to give yourself a longer runway to keep your business growing. Yeah. Um, you don't want to like kind of feel like you need to seek other employment or give up on your entrepreneurial endeavors because of a cash crunch. That's really interesting. I've never, well, I guess now I, um, I took my business full time, but through the lens of selling it to a larger company that is now I'm a W2 employee again. So I can't really speak to how that would feel to totally go without quote unquote traditional employment, but I can see why or imagine why having a year's worth of spending money just kind of in the coffers would feel better because then it's like oh I'm having a lean month it's okay it, it doesn't mean that I need to go be frantic or make business decisions out of this place of scarcity I know I can support myself and keep that long-term vision which I think is really important when you're early on trying to grow something yeah that's exactly right and I would just add I'm sure your listeners are, are hearing all sorts of advice about cash, especially considering yeah. the inflation that we're experiencing. And while I never want anyone to have too much cash, the amount that would be considered to be too much is absolutely much higher for someone who's self-employed. So, I mean, I appreciate and I'm experiencing, you know, the high inflation myself right now, but mm -hmm. cash is still queen without a doubt. Cash is queen. Oh, I like that. Thank you. <laughs> See, everybody, usually people say cash is king. So I really like that we're, that we're calling it queen. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so my last question for you, Lauren, I always tell people that have 1099 income, hey, get the SEP IRA, get the solo 401k. Like you can invest in your own retirement plans that you are providing yourself as your own employer. And I know that the rules get a little bit stickier if you have full-time employees and whatnot. Is there anything mm -hmm. else that you can think of that's pertinent for people with this type of self-employment income? Yeah. So, um, I, I love a SEP IRA. A SEP mm -hmm. IRA is a fantastic place to start. Um, but something that I've realized over the years working with entrepreneurs is that they fail to see that their SEP IRA really is the replacement for a traditional employer sponsored plan, like a yep. 401k or 403b. And they do in fact still have the ability to contribute to a traditional or Roth IRA as well. Mm -hmm. um, so if you are contributing to a SEP out of your business income and you appreciate the value that comes along with tax-free growth, or you know you understand and appreciate the appeal of a Roth, you can still take advantage of that. 
even though you have a SEP and are contributing to the SEP too. So I don't think it's a matter of um, an either or. Or it's mm-hmm. more being aware that you can, in fact, have both. And so I, I don't want people to overlook such a valuable tool when they're saving and investing for retirement. Absolutely. And I, I believe the SEP IRA can only be pre-tax, but the solo 401k, you can do either. Um, is that your understanding as well? It depends on how you set up the solo 401k. Most 401ks do have the option for either pre-tax or Roth or after-tax contributions. A solo 401k is usually going to be a little bit more expensive and take more kind of like time and administrative effort to manage than the SEP. But um, you're absolutely right. A a SEP IRA can only receive pre-tax contributions. So again, if you kind of like the idea of maybe diversifying mm-hmm. the tax treatment of your long-term savings. You can have that pre-tax in the SEP and a Roth also. Beautiful. Uh, and for our listeners, I have a pretty deep dive breakdown of both of these types of accounts. We'll link it in the show notes. If you're like, wait a second, I am a solopreneur and I don't have either of these. Um, so we'll put them in the show notes for you. Lauren, thank you so much for being here. It was such a pleasure. Any last words, anything else that you want to share with our listeners or anything that you want to leave us with before you go that I didn't ask you about? The one thing that I, I will add, um, really one of the best pieces of advice that I could possibly give is to be very comfortable uh, and allowing yourself to invest in a a strong team of advisors. So I know that your capital is precious, especially when you're first starting out, Mm -hmm. but whether it's an attorney or a financial planner or a tax professional like a CPA, someone to help guide you throughout the process of growing your business, Mm -hmm. whether it's strictly to give you business advice or both business and personal advice, They can really provide you just invaluable guidance to protect yourself legally, but also provide you with tax advantages. Mm -hmm. Um, So a very commonly overlooked step of establishing your own business, but one that I, I would put at the top of the list for sure. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Lauren, thanks so much for being here. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right, y'all, that is all for this week. Before we go, comment below what you thought the most interesting part of our conversation was and remember to like and subscribe to our channel. I will see you next week, same time, same place on The Money With Katie Show. Our show is a production of Morning Brew and is produced by Nick Torres and me. Sarah Singer is our VP of Multimedia and additional content editing comes from our lovely senior editor, Anna Velez. Our video producers are Emily Milliron and Christy Muldoon and Sam Cat here is our vice president of chaos while Jojo Beans is our chief of wolf barking at any passerby regardless of how well the recording is going. <laughs>